Hi, everyone. I'm so excited to be able to continue the exploration of what makes a more just built environment with today's feminist city. In this conversation, we're going to ask, what does a feminist future look like and how do we build communities of care? We've brought together Leslie Kern, an associate professor of geography and environment and the director of women's and gender studies at Mount Allison University and our own Anna Pujaner, associate professor, uh, associate professor of professional practice to speak with Jack Halberstam, professor of gender studies and English and the director of the Institute of Research on Women, Gender and Sexuality. Thank you to Jack and I IRWGS for partnering with us. It's my great pleasure to welcome you. Welcome, Jack. Okay, thank you so much. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, here we are in a virtual um, landscape of some kind, uh, and we are going to discuss today um, Leslie Kern's uh, fantastic new book, The Feminist City. And um, as Amale said, uh, Leslie will be um, presenting alongside uh, Anna Pujane, um, and who writes, uh, has written an, an amazing piece called The Kitchenless City about communities of women in Lima who create um, public kitchens. Um, and what we're, the way things are going to work, Leslie will do a presentation on her book. Anna will do a presentation on her research. I'll make a very brief response, and then we will try to um, curate a lively Q&A. Um, so we're going to start, the order of things is that we're going to start with uh, Anna Pujane. Uh, and Anna, I think this would be a good time to uh, start your video and maybe um, set up your shared screen. Thank you, Jack, for um, the intro, and uh, I will jump in really fast. Um, to start sharing my screen. And in the meantime, let me thanks, um, thank the school for organizing this event, as well as uh, Lila for um, the invitation. Um, I'm really happy to be here uh, today with Leslie and Jack to discuss about the future of feminist cities. And. Uh, I will probably address um, um, contemporary collective kitchens uh, during the Q&A um, and address, um, as Jack mentioned, um, the actual research that I'm um, doing about um, uh, collective practices in different cities that are able to um, uh, restructure um, and, uh, systems of power. But uh, finally today, I decided just to um, um, talk about the upcoming book, uh, Kitsila City, that um, does a more historical survey about the city of New York. And this is a book that will luckily come out soon <laughs> uh, about a type of building with collective um, amenities as uh, shared housekeeping services that emerged in New York at the verge of the 20th century um, um, from... Uh, from 1871 until 1929. And they were called um, non-housekeeping apartments, family hotels, or more, most commonly called also apartment hotels, and were quite successful and uh, quite profitable for developers and desired by small family structures, singles, especially working women, but also the elderly. And why do I think that um, this book is uh, relevant? Because I think that the problematic division between uh, productive and reproductive labor that emerged with uh, capitalists still defines our way of living and generates a lot of social biases. So it's important to keep on talking about architectural proposals that try to reshape six, um, existing enclosures based on race, gender, age, and class that have been so characteristic of uh, the capitalist society that we're living in. But let me, um, just to, to frame a little bit um, more this uh, distinction between productive and reproductive uh, labor, let me trace back um, uh, uh, some centuries and, uh, and explain a little bit uh, its historical background. So the transition uh, from feudalism to capitalism uh, was characterized by the so-called primitive accumulation as defined by Marx. 
which was based on the progressive concentration of land along with the operation of the formation of the independent worker, which happened, and I'm talking about the centuries from 14th century up until 18th century. Workers has for, um, became independent from the land and became wage earners. And it's precisely with the emerge of the wage system um, that the idea of man as free productive force disposed of his own means of production then was defined. And of course, the consequences of this transformation shape uh, societal relation in all scales, from the body to the home, from the work to the territory, and, but also uh, its management and divisions. And in fact, as Silvia Federici recalls pretty well in her book, um, The Witch, The Caliban and the Witch, this protocol capitalist uh, process required the transformation of the body into a work machine and resulted in the submission of women for the production, uh, for the reproduction workforce. In that sense, uh, primitive accumulation not only required the accumulation of goods, but also the accumulation of differences and divisions within the working class, and which hierarchy is built on, uh, as mentioned, Jay's, um, gender, race, um, and age, became constitutive of the formation of the modern proletariat. And amidst this gigantic transformation, the idea of home and the city was gradually built uh, in the image and likeness of these structural changes, progressively dividing and separating productive spaces, mostly occupied by men, from residential places, mostly um, from uh, residential places of reproductive work, mostly occupied by women. And architecture played a huge role uh, to define these divisions during um, the Enlightenment time, but also afterwards, especially during the period of industrialization. What happened with the first industrial revolution um, is that it meant that transition from to new manufacturing processes, both in Europe and the United States. In the late 18th century, the invasion of the spinning jenny and the development of uh, motor driving machineries culminated in the settlement of new factories and the generation of uh, new labor. It was then when women enter uh, into industrial labor and needed consequentially to combine both works, productive and reproductive at the same time. Answering to this struggle um, and the growth of these industrial uh, processes, several voices emerge, uh, the well, and they're extremely well known and deeply influential uh, as uh, Robert um, Owen or Chasse Fourier among others that claim the reformulation of labor and capitalist uh, social structures. The book uh, wants to get to go deeper into which uh, into this period, which Dolores Hayden called the Grand Domestic Revolution, in which a lot of architectural proposals tried to envision a new society in which uh, reproductive uh, labor was uh, redefined. But while Dolores Hayden uh, addressed her attention to the work of material feminist, um, social utopist, and the free lovers, among others, the book unveils uh, those housing businesses that emerged in New York at that time, which uh, operativity and principles were really similar to some of the material feminist ideas. And to my surprise, when I started researching, I could find hundreds of, of them just in Manhattan, which allow me to understand the impact in New York City at the verge of their impact in New York City at the verge of the 20th century. Um, this, um, in, on the image, you have some examples of them. So we could speculate that these capitalist initiatives were kind of engulfing and appropriating some of socialist claims. As it, happen, as it has just happened with the recent sharing economy, which despite initial principles have often only further patriarchal, colonial and extravagant regimes. Uh, but I think that that assumption could be a bit too oversimplified um, and um, because the situation was, was a bit much more complex. Obviously, um, probably they were um, referenced uh, or influenced by, uh, by the social utopies or indirect, directly or indirectly. 
But it's true that the growing culture around industrialization invited us to think about the value of the collective, not only as a force of production, but also as a way of living. Um, but not only that, also there was the influence of living in hotels. Hotel living was quite common at that time. Um, in the first, it was quite popular in the first half of the um, 19th century. Actually, the first hotels emerged at the end of uh, 18th century, just after, right after the constitution of the United States. Um, with the early republic and the new bourgeoisie society emerging, there was a need in the United States of a new typology and a building able to represent this social change. So it was right after the, the new constitution that Washington, that Washington had its first uh, hotel in 1793, and it was one of the premier civic spaces to be, a, a, a real blend of an image of uh, democracy and commerce at the same time. And uh, hotels really fast became technological, places of technological experimentations, being the first ones, for instance, to have running water or flushing toilets. Actually, by the way, um, the first indoor flashing toilets were not gender segregated, as uh, Susan Stryker mentions um, in her writings. Uh, so the book is divided in four chapters. It starts from the very beginning, from the emerge of this typology. And the history of uh, these apartment hotels dates back right after the depression of, uh, that followed the American Civil War um, in 1860, 1865, that due to the lack of land and housing in stock, actually most American cities needed to build apartments and lower the cost for middle income tenants. Working families with medium salaries as teachers, artists, vendors couldn't neither afford to buy a townhouse, neither to rent it, but also neither afford or accept to build in tenement buildings that were actually the only collective housing available, um, that uh, lack of facilities, bathrooms, um, kitchens, and so, uh, but also they were overpopulated and lack of healthiness. So these type of images were um, usually filled uh, the media. So there was a need of a new type of multi developing housing um, to improve actually the tenement's conditions. And appear at the time in 1870, different housing typologies, and some of them remembering the hotel living and influenced by the social utopies, combined the European apartment type with the American hotel type. So in already in 1871, just one year after the first the so-called first up collective housing apartment um, in New York was built. Always the idea of first is a bit tricky because there were many before that. Um, but at the, in, uh, as I was mentioning in 1871, it opened an apartment hotel with old, uh, an apartment building with hotel services, which apartments uh, had kitchens, but there was a shared kitchen at the ground as many other shared amenities. And right after the Hyde House, uh, the Stevens also opens, and the Grosvenor um, as well. Uh, and the Grosvenor was the first one to open uh, the collective kitchen to the public, operating it as a, um, as a restaurant. So suddenly these uh, domestic institutions became in between the private and the public sphere. And this typology between um, the apartment hotel and the, an apartment and hotel was quite successful and desired for a wide range of population. And we know um, that uh, because of um, the proof of the diversity of the dwellers, um, we know that looking to the floor plan. So we can find uh, a small typologies uh, of a small size apartments like this one with just two rooms and a bathroom to extremely uh, large one as the Astor apartment house, which contain two apartments per floor. And as you see in the image, many, many rooms uh, and many different types of, of, of services, but no kitchen at all. We know as well that this phenomenon of, of um, auto services and apartment uh, buildings were not 
and were not just happen. It didn't just happen in New York, and it also happened in many other cities. Just that in New York flourished a lot um, for many reasons, as we will see. Um, so during the early years, most of these typologies were built around Fifth Avenue, but with the opening of the elevated railroad alongside 9th Avenue in 1879, as well as a consolidation of Central Park in the 70s, most were built in the Upper West Side area. area. The West Fort completed in 1889, when it was will, built was totally isolated. And from the last floor, one could enjoy spectacular views from Central Park and the surroundings. So sadly, the easy accessibility, thanks to the elevator and the views that uh, this type of high uh, buildings offer, um, converted the top floor an attractive place to be. And suddenly, all those collective amenities and shared spaces started to occupy these uh, this outdoor um, spaces becoming public dining places and places of leisure um, and uh, particularly and really important places of social engagement. And as you see these uh, buildings in the Upper West Side in contrast with the Hyde House and the former buildings that we saw were much larger and um, and uh, and, uh, and it started to have many more amenities but also what is interesting about them is that they started to offer a lot of flexibility in terms of the compositions of the apartments. As we see in the San Remo, um, the, the hotel, for instance, offer different size apartments ranging from between two rooms with a bathroom until nine rooms with two bathrooms. And the choices uh, happened because there was a room that connected uh, the different uh, um, apartments. So it allowed to uh, enlarge or decrease the apartment size um, depending on the demand. At this time already, we're talking about a time that uh, the uh, typology has already 30 years old. So it started to be quite mature and they uh, knew for sure that this flexibility uh, would um, assure better rentability. The Ansonia, for instance, that was built at the verge of the 20th century, apart from allowing the apartments to stand and the, um, expand and decrease, also offer uh, apartments with kitchens and apartments without kitchen. The diversity of apartments, as you see in this image, was extremely large. And they started, and that's a key also for their later uh, decade, they started to rent uh, single rooms in a in a temporal uh, manner, so uh, similar uh, similarly to hotels. So those rooms that allowed to expand and decrease suddenly they started to be rented per night as well. And the services were extraordinary. Uh, I mean, the, the Ansonia had a dining room of one thousand three hundred people and and a, and, a, and a gym and. And a parking, and even a farm on the roof that uh, had 500 chickens and dogs, and they were offering fresh milk and eggs to the inhabitants. So it, they were like, you know, offering this kind of extraordinary um, uh, amenities to the residents. What is interesting, and this is the key of the success in New York of this typology, is that. Uh, as you see in the floor, in in, the, in this map that I started mapping where they were, there's there's actually a boom after um, 1901, um, and this um, peak that started in 1901 and it ended up in 1929, it um, uh, happened because the um, um, the enactment of um, the first housing law, the tenement house law, that it was defined in 1901 in order to regulate the conditions of residential buildings, but particularly the conditions of those tenements that I was showing before, which needed to be improved. And the law suddenly left kitchenless apartments outside of its scope to the point that an apartment hotel could be built higher and larger in the same lot than 
and a building with uh, uh, kitchen apartments. So this looser legal framework made apartment hotels a clearly advantages, uh, clearly the advantages for developers in New York, uh, who then suddenly saw uh, the typology as an amazing uh, good investment. But not only that, consequently, suddenly also the collective uh, domestic services uh, were uh, really affordable for a wider range of the population because they, the prices could be reduced. So the book, I'm going to just go really fast through the last, uh, through the other uh, three chapters, just to give you a glimpse of, of um, what it shows. Um, the second chapter uh, talks about, uh, uh, describes the several different um, projects that the Ready Dolores Hayden talk about them, of these social um, utopias that uh, define cities based on uh, shared uh, productive labor, collective reproductive labor. And I trace how these uh, projects happen at the same time those commercial um, um, initiatives were um, uh, also happening. And I established certain relations among them and I do relate how these um, utopist um, socialist projects are linked also with the emerge of certain uh, technologies during the second uh, part of the 19th century. The third uh, chapter probably is my favorite one. Um, I uh, talk about a phenomenon that starts in these kitchenless apartments at the verge of the 20th century when they start to um, uh, um, host little cooking devices. So at the beginning, it was just the installation um, of uh, small cooking devices for uh, a light cooking once in a while to complement the, the collective kitchen. But uh, these uh, um, um, casual uh, cooking devices that were installed and started to be uh, largely public, published in magazines and newspaper, it they were soon uh, and really fast commodified and sold as uh, furniture, pieces of furniture that could uh, occupy any any cupboard available or any corner, any nook, and to turn that space into um, a small kitchen, into a compact kitchen. But all these compact kitchens happened way before uh, 1926, uh, the famous 1926 Frankfurt Kitchen, and they were deeply influential to the definition of the typology during this uh, first decade of, of the 20th century. Um, they were, as I mentioned, commercialized as a space-saving device. And we know that the compact kitchen was related always with a collective kitchen, looking to uh, the detail of these uh, commercial uh, compact kitchens that, as you see in the image, uh, the ice compartment always had two doors, one connecting to the corridor, the other one connecting to the indoor space in order to allow this exchange of, um, of uh, services. So in other words, the food that was coming from the collective uh, kitchen could be um, um, placed directly in the ice compartment that had also a hot compartment above. And I explain how these kitchens uh, through, uh, especially in the second decade of the 20th century started to be appropriated and engulfed by domestic engineers and how uh, really fast started to be understood not as space sa uh, saving device, but rather as labor saving devices. And the fourth and last chapter explains what happens with the typology after the First World War in the Roaring Twenties. It's a moment of, uh, again, an explosion of the construction of this type influenced, deeply influenced by the new zoning law of 1916, that due to that fact, the new housing, um, um, the apartment hotels started to be combined with, or combined with other uses in order to fill these huge envelopes defined by the law. So apartment hotels started to be combined with hotels, I, sorry, with museums, with, um, with the schools, other uses. And how the famous, um, uh, shared rooftops started to disappear in favor of private terraces and how obviously living in the air started to be um, something to, to sell 
and Hai started to be also a strategy for, for class classification, the higher the better. And I uh, introduced how Central Station was uh, so influential for a new generation of apartment hotels that they started to understand the city at large. And thanks to the influence of this project, in 1929 and 25, um, Tudor City emerged. It was the first um, uh, uh, um, part of the city that offer kitchenless apartments and kitchen apartments with shared amenities that operate in a neighborhood level. So all these buildings uh, relate one to each other and share the uh, collective kitchens and the different domestic amenities. It was a real city within a city. The chapter ends up um, talking about the decay of the typology and why after 1929, um, uh, the typology started to disappear. First, because a series of, of legal procedures that the hotel lobby started in, in 1926, and, and they were all and they were called under the title bootleg hotels. Basically, the hotel lobby, hotel lobby started to be a little bit um, jealous or thought that these uh, apartment types were actually doing um, an unfair competition to their business and they were put they put a lot of pressure to change the housing law so in 1929 as a consequence the housing law was changed and suddenly this typology lost all its privilege along and it, this is not only the this is not the only reason why of the decay, but there were many others, as uh, obviously the, the, the crack of the economic crack that happened in 1929, but also the emerge of domestic engineer and the success of understanding that productive labor could be combined easily with reproductive labor. And I'm going to leave it here to continue doing the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. There's so much to discuss there. Very, very excited to hear about this research. Um, okay, Leslie, we're going to turn over to you to hear about the Feminist City, and then we'll see if we can bring these um, two projects together. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you to um, the different programs and, and departments at Columbia for inviting me, and I'm really grateful to both Jack and Anna for being um, joining me on this panel and, and setting us up for what will hopefully be a great conversation. So as our, as the introductions shared, I am the author of a recent book called Feminist City, Claiming Space in a Man-Made World. And I will talk a little bit about the book, but I also want to uh, kind of rush us fast forward to the very, very, very present moment and have a conversation about what some of the ideas about a feminicity have to say or can speak to in the present moment. So I'm coming to you today from what is currently known as Sackville, New Brunswick, Canada on the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq and Wolastikai people where we are governed by treaties of peace and friendship. My institution is Mount Allison University which is uh, kind of the Canadian version of a small liberal arts college. This book was written uh, well before COVID and it's been fascinating to me to be talking about this work in a time when uh, so many of these ideas, suddenly people are like, oh yes, these things are, are a problem or this is something that we should be talking about. And for many of us, it's like, well, yes, we, <laughs> we should have been talking about these things all along. So I just want to acknowledge right away that I am definitely not the first person to say either anything that is <laughs> in the book or the things that I'm going to share with you in our conversation today. So this book, just to give you a tiny little sense of what it's what it's about, it's meant for a wide audience of people and my vision was to sort of connect based on um, personal experience of uh, living in the city with all of the tensions that that brings for those who are women and 
to explore from both the perspective of, you know, what are the opportunities offered by the city and what are also the constraints. And again, I think in the present moment, we're really, those, those things have been really sharpened for us in um, some quite, I think, quite visceral ways. So the good news is that people seem to be open to hearing some of these uh, feminist, anti-racist, decolonial critiques of disciplines like planning, urban design, and architecture. And you know, I'm hoping that this is a moment where some of those themes in the book about the ways in which the spaces around us are not just stages where our social relations play out, but that they are um, also active participants in these kinds of social relations and that they are not sort of God-given, right? We can change the built environment and we can set it up to support the kinds of societies that we want to have. All right, as I said, I just wanna really launch us right into the present moment. So I'm gonna share a couple of uh, headlines from recently. So first one, her kid had a stuffy nose. Now hers is one of many Ontario families in COVID-19 testing limbo. So this is a story about families where their kids are going back to school. They have a runny nose, which is like 80% of children all the time, right? But they have to come out of school, be tested for COVID. And there's a long backlog because of course, uh, there's a massive uptick in this now that schools have gone back in. And the thing to note is that every story that I've seen about this um, is always the mother who has had to stay home from work while they're waiting for their child to be tested and to get the results of that test. Here's another one again from Canada, from Toronto, which is my home city. Um, overcrowded buses worry commuters as COVID-19 cases rise and weather turns colder. The TTC acknowledges physical distancing is not possible on some routes. And these routes that the uh, Transit Commission is talking about are the routes, the, the primarily bus routes that run through what we call the inner suburbs in Toronto, which are lower income, racialized, recent immigrant neighborhoods where the kind of people who do the essential labor and the underpaid care labor of the city are commuting from. So they are uniquely and disproportionately exposed to the risks of having to take overcrowded public transit with a system that seems to say there's nothing we can do about it. Uh, a couple of others, parents who work in childcare are trapped in an unsustainable system. So this piece points out that people who provide childcare, paid childcare, don't make enough money to put their own children in childcare, right? So this becomes this uh, catch-22 kind of situation. And you know, no surprise to many people, the pandemic has exacerbated the gender divide in household labor, where we have a situation where in many families, uh, heterosexual families, the male partner is still not doing their full share of the work. So I wanted to share these and to give you a couple of Canadian headlines as well to really illustrate for uh, maybe a primarily American but also international audience that even in a country where we say that the pandemic has been handled relatively well, that these kinds of gendered and racialized care labor problems persist. And what this suggests to me is that there are a whole lot of assumptions still underlying the way that we set up our cities and our homes and a whole lot of being okay with relying on a very shaky, unequal and exploitative status quo that some people are only just realizing is kind of a problem. So COVID did not create these problems, right? Not not at all. <laughs> These things go back a very, very long time. But the question we can ask is, you know, where do we find communities of care and what are our cities doing or not doing that could be making a difference here? So I argue both in the book and in all of my kind of ranting about these topics over the last few months that cities have been long been content pretty much to assume that the provisioning of care will happen in the home and will be largely unpaid. So we might ask, you know, how active have cities been in creating or lobbying for affordable or free childcare? Um, have they been just waiting for national governments to maybe possibly sort of do something about this, which is a recent promise of our uh, federal government here in Canada? How many cities have actively and positively responded to calls for living wages and higher minimum wages? 
which would impact primarily women, people of color, and those in all of these underpaid service and caregiving work jobs, some of which suddenly got called essential labor. So it's clear to many of us that we are in a care crisis and in some ways it's nothing new, but the COVID situation has really amplified it in many ways. So I'm just gonna put uh, a few points up here for us to think about, right? The first one that care work has remained and I would argue quite deliberately <laughs> hidden and invisible within the private family home. This is a status quo that works quite well for some people, right? So there's been, I would say, relatively little interest in actually um, changing this status quo. The second point um, is that in many households, men still do not do a full share of childcare and housework. Perhaps even more importantly, public care work, so that is work that uh, is paid and is done in what we call the public sphere, has still been underpaid, undervalued, and even stigmatized and therefore has fallen to the most marginalized groups in society, people of color, recent immigrants. And we've certainly seen that those are the groups who have been most disproportionately exposed to the harms of COVID in part because of the care work that they do. So again, even here in you know, this wonderful paradise of Canada, people who worked, uh, especially in places like long-term care homes who are primarily recent immigrants, low-income people, women, even refugees, um, have had higher rates of COVID infection and, and deaths than other people in the population. And, and I think we're also seeing that, that some very problematic assumptions about who does care work really do run rampant in policymaking in every sector because it seems to have come as a surprise to our governments that it is that like you can't reopen the economy without school and childcare. And it's sort of like, oh, right, yes, that's, that's going to be a problem. So to me, what that illustrates is that we have been for a very long time kind of okay to rest on the assumption that care work, even if it's being done unequally and kind of exploitatively, it's okay, it's being done in the home without really realizing um, those other aspects of our social system that are that really allow the economy to run and when you take some of those pieces away whether it's pay child care or schooling then the whole house of cards starts to come crumbling down so then what does it mean to envision a feminist city or as i say here a, a potentially a more feminist city as a kind of aspirational both concept and hopefully real place. So to me, we can also maybe think about some new assumptions and starting points. And, and let me just say right here that when I was planning this talk, I was thinking, oh, geez, this is Columbia. I, I, I better have some smart things to say, right? I better bring some theory to this conversation, better really show that I know what I'm talking about. But ultimately, I have just kept coming back to points that seem so wildly obvious and yet seem to require re-articulation again and again and again. So I apologize if this like doesn't seem smart, but I don't know what else to do except keep talking about these things in the hope that we can drive some of these points home to the places that really need to hear them. And that would include people in urban planning, design and architecture pro uh, professions, policymakers, politicians and even just you know us everyday people as well okay so the first one that i put up here is is the idea that uh, what we think of as the minority is perhaps the majority or the idea that the niche is the whole so i think sometimes there's an assumption that if we plan like a city for women or if we plan around the elderly or disabled people or queer families or recent immigrants that we're planning for a minority and that we're focusing on a niche. But what I want to suggest is that, is that when you take all of those so-called minorities together, that they are actually the majority. And that this thing that we have been thinking of as the majority, like a white middle-class family, cis, able-bodied, heterosexual, like that might actually be the minority at this point. So we know, for example, that you know, a really large percentage of the population has some form of a disability. 
we know that in most um, so-called developed countries, our population is aging. So let's stop thinking about designing for these different groups as kind of a niche project and actually think of it as that is the majority project. That is the, that is the center, not the margin, right? So bring the margin to the center. Thank you, Bell Hooks. Uh, my second point, home is not what we think it is, right? And again, this is very clearly illustrated, at, especially at the beginning of the pandemic with isolation and lockdown, where uh, again, it seemed like for some people, the realization that home is not a safe space for everybody that home is, um, that not everybody has a home, right? That home is not a place where many people can work and live and take care of children at the same time. So really showing, I think, a lot of uh, very class and race biased assumptions about what home is and the ways in which we think about the kinds of homes that we want to provide as you know city planners and so on really needs like a profound shaking up uh, around this idea that home is not what we have thought it was for, for so long. Third point, yeah, people have bodies, right? Again, something that seems to have been forgotten maybe in a lot of planning, but that is coming to the fore in this moment. And just from stories like, um, you know, people going to public parks and having nowhere to go to the bathroom. So we're being told socialize outside, go to public space, do this sort of thing. And yet there's no toilets and suddenly people are saying, oh yeah, why don't we have any public toilets? Um, again, people have been talking about this for a long time, but nobody has paid attention. So when we're thinking about new ways of using public space, of kind of turning some of the outside inside and vice versa, we have to keep in mind the very real messy embodied reality of a city for people and not just people who are workers who are just moving in linear ways from one place to the next, but that people who have needs for sitting and rest and shelter and shade and food and toilets and care. And again, maybe instead of those being extras that we add on to the places that we design, the buildings that we make, maybe that is the center and not something um, that we add on at the end. My final point here, I'll just say it, uh, you know, we can argue about this, I guess, maybe some people would argue about this, but I think care work is the economy or at least that there is no separation really between care work and what we have come to call the economy, which has all sorts of assumptions behind it, just that language that what, that what counts as the economy is this so-called uh, public world of work. It's our restaurants and bars apparently is the economy. When we know that when we pull that or we shake up that piece of around care work, when we pull that out, when we don't support it properly, both in terms of a redistribution of that labor and in terms of paying people to do that labor well and so on, then we kind of, things really can uh, collapse at that point. So for me, this is not just about uh, a kind of redistribution within the home. So yes, I showed that slide about, you know, men not still doing their, their full share of um, childcare work and so on in the home, but we can't rely on just sort of individualizing this problem and telling people to kind of like, telling men to man up, I guess, and, and change more diapers, because this to me is a broader question, right? We don't wanna just bring this back to a set of solutions that are essentially based around the private family. And again, a, an assumption about what the family is and what the home is. So we have to think about ways of redistributing care labor in, in um, a much wider way in so that we are thinking about all sorts of different family forms. So it doesn't make sense to talk about redistribution of care labor in the home for single parents, for example. We also want to think about queer families. We want to think about families of um, essential workers, people who simply don't have the kind of freedom to like rejuggle who's going to do the dishes and who's going to get the kids to school and so on. So we have to think about what are the public solutions to that and maybe what also are those sorts of spatial solutions to that. So how can we create spaces for care? Now, this is where, again, I make a confession, right? I'm not a planner or an architect. In fact, I'm barely a geographer. My degrees are in women's and gender studies. So I come to this from a very particular and somewhat outsider set of 
angles. So all I can offer are some provocations for people who may have more direct influence over these sorts of things. But what are some first steps, right? What are the ways in which those who have the will and the power to do so can think about these problems in different ways? So one would be, first of all, recognizing what already exists in terms of uh, different sorts of care networks, recognizing what is already there that is outside of what we call the economy, right, or what we call care work in the home and, and realizing that there's like a whole kind of in between world where people do all sorts of things for one another that are somewhat outside of even, you know, capitalism and that involve all kinds of other social networks. So we don't have to reinvent everything from the ground up. There's a lot of people already doing this sort of work. Uh, we also have to make it intersectional, right? And not just sort of replace one dominant group with another slightly less dominant group and, and think about how the city will work for them. But the benefit of this to me though, is that actually some of the spatial solutions that work for one group of people can actually be quite good for many groups of people. So it's not that intersectionality makes us, uh, kind of locks us into a position where we are again only serving the needs of one very narrow group of people, but actually when we kind of design from the needs of the most marginalized, for example, we end up serving a really wide variety of needs, I think. So an intersectional analysis should not be something that we maybe add on at the end if we have time, but we can start there and see where that takes us. Uh, supporting care networks, not care boxes. And what I mean by care boxes is like the home, right? Or the single family home. So we want to think about how can we set up our cities, our transportation networks, our spaces within cities, our social services, our linkages and so on, such that care becomes networked and distributed and not focused within uh, the very problematic single family home. So leading to the next point, let's just like blow up the home and the family, right? And I, I guess I don't totally mean that literally, but what I mean is more blow up our ideas about what the home and the family is. And it was so exciting to hear Anna speak, but also kind of um, like frustrating because you think, oh, all of these ideas have been around for so long and we've lost sight of so many different ways of making homes or even the idea that homes could be flexible spaces. So that to me is like both hopeful and frustrating, but maybe mostly hopeful. And then finally, I would say, you know, giving communities control. So what works for one neighborhood might not work for another neighborhood and different groups of people need to feel ownership over the kinds of spaces, networks, buildings, and so on that um, people might design for them. So as I said, you know, is there anything new here? In many ways, I don't think so. And yet the COVID crisis seems to have led many people to simply be discovering things for the first time, like that domestic violence is a problem, that unpaid care work is not a sustainable way of setting up our economy, that there is still a gender division of labor and that there's underpaid service work being done by racialized and otherwise marginalized people in our society. And to me, this is you know, why we cannot aim to go back to normal because normal was really kind of messed up, quite frankly. So going back to normal is not really an option. The fact that some people seem to be hearing about or discovering or just thinking about some of these things for the first time in their lives um, says really to me, it says a lot about how power works, right? Power works to kind of hide all of the things that are existing to support your power and privilege. And when some of those um, curtains get peeled back and you can suddenly see all of the things that have been set up to make your life easier at the expense of others. Um, hopefully we don't just pull the curtains back over that. So many people might be quote unquote discovering these things for the first time, but my hope is that we can make sure that they don't forget them and have to rediscover them again in, in the future. So those are my remarks. Thank you. Um, I'll make my publicists happy by putting a link to the book in the, in the chat. Thank you. All right. Beautiful. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you, uh, Anna. Um, I'm in a, a, a weird internet spot. So if I freeze or 
disappear or something, just just be patient. I will come back. Um, so it's a real pleasure to listen to these presentations and to have a chance to respond to some of the ideas presented here. Um, my relationship to uh, architecture has come in the form of a kind of deep engagement uh, with the ideas of Gordon Matt Clark and the Ann Architecture Group of the 1970s and taking some of those concepts from that vocabulary uh, of unbuilding and dismantling and trying to apply it to queer, contemporary queer theory and um, different notions of a gendered body that instead of trying to build a body, we might be interested now in unbuilding. And I think if we apply that to the concept of the gendered city, this idea that we shouldn't just be building a gendered city, but we should also be unbuilding um, the patriarchal systems and foundations and subsystems that invisibly support um, uh, a, you know, a city through which white men move easily, uh, conduct commerce uninterrupted, uh, and uh, enable the flow of global capital. That's part of the project that I would like to sort of introduce into the conversation here. And actually, the Anna Architecture Group, uh, some of their projects connected nicely with what Anna's talking about in the sense that one of their projects was called Food and was about creating collective spaces for both uh, conviviality that was organized around sharing food, but also the distribution of food. And so with Anna's project, I guess I wanted to hear a little bit more about the gendered uh, arc of this narrative in which we move from sort of collective imaginaries of shared living spaces in which the space that is your own is just a space into which you might retire, but that many of the functions that we now think about as private were in fact shared collective spaces that encourage people to think about labor is shared, to think about um, uh, you know, what was possible if many people within a certain area work together on something, you know, all of those ideas are available in these apartment hotels that you describe. So my question about that is how often was there a kind of feminist intention or a Marxist intention or even an anarchist intention behind these collective projects? And how, how does, how do those ideas then get taken up in the communities that you're researching in Lima, Peru, where there are these community kitchens uh, that women are, you know, building and developing in order to not just share food, but to share labor, to break labor out of its, you know, dependence upon uh, the intense activities of uh, a group of women, right? So that that's one question that I, I would love to um, hear you answer. And then Leslie, I guess that my first question is very obvious, which is, who is the woman of the feminist city? You know, I mean, the category of woman is so contested today um, that it doesn't seem like there would be an obvious subject there of the feminist city. And I know in no way are you simply referring to woman as the subject of the feminist city. So how might we think about these new gender templates that both emerge alongside the reimagined built environment, but also are productive of new relations within a built environment? So how can we, how can we rethink gender and architecture together as opposed to thinking about one as enabling uh, the other? In relationship to that, um, I was thinking a lot about Samuel Delaney's book, Times Square Red, Times Square Blue. I don't, yeah, I think probably you, you know this book, which, um, you know, was written over a decade ago and was about the way in which the gentrification of Times Square in the 1990s completely eradicated subterranean sex cultures of the kind that Delaney himself participated uh, in. And through his um, I, his his meditation on the disappearance of these uh, sex worlds, Delaney has some deep insights into the way in which gender and sexuality are inscribed in uh, urban landscapes. But one 
anecdote from that book is interesting uh, in relationship to some of Leslie's work. So Delaney talks about the way in which in public parks, um, women who were going to the parks with their kids really needed access to the bathrooms, which is something that Leslie's brought up a couple of times. But the bathrooms had been closed down because the city was concerned that gay men were using the bathrooms to cruise and to have sex. And this then sets up the feminist city in a way in opposition to one version of the queer city where the queer city wants to make sort of public spaces available uh, for certain kinds of sexual activity, the feminist city wants to create safe spaces. So how can we think about the feminist city and the queer city together? And Delaney was really using uh, Jane Jacobs ideas there of eyes on the street to try to think through the conundrum of women and children in the park, but also what about queer people in the park? What about homeless people in the park? How can these spaces be scripted in such a way that all, you know, all different communities who want to enter into these public and common spaces have the ability to do so without producing new forms of policing uh, that are directed by one group um, against um, another? Um, Finally, I think it's really important, to, you know, given the moment that we live in, given all the Black Lives Matter protests, given the intense policing of Black bodies in cityscapes, um, I was thinking also about Saidiya Hartman's uh, book, Wayward uh, Lives, and about the various laws on a, in New York City over the past century that have literally been directed. So, so we, we, how does race work within this paradigm? And then finally, one of my pet peeves has been the enormous amount of energy, time, and resources put into creating dog runs in cities. Like the preference, the, 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 you know, the, the kind of privileging of projects around pets and animals over, and I'm not saying over human projects, I'm just saying, why are we so full of ideas about how dogs can relieve themselves, how dogs can get enough exercise? And yet we seem to draw a blank when it comes to how can we make the city a more collective space? How can we share space in ways that um, push to one side completely the mechanisms of policing? How can we think the history of the city in ways that unburden us of these deep histories of um, racial division, class division, and gendered danger, okay? So those are big questions, but nestled within them are some specific questions each for Leslie and uh, Anna. And I'm happy to, you know, we can go back and forth as a conversation, or, but, you know, why don't we go first Anna and then Leslie, and then we'll see what we have. A, a lot to to answer. I'll try to, uh, to answer most of it. Um, I will start with race because it's the last question that you throw me. And uh, actually, I I uh, I was doubting to address it during my talk, and I decided to leave it for the Q and A because I was sure that I was going to be asked. And I, I'm really thankful that you did. Uh, obviously, New York at the time was deeply racialized, deeply. So most of these apartment houses were inhabited mostly by white pop, um, white citizens, uh, but not only, not all of them. And um, and one of the cases that were was probably was the most well known was the Teresa Hotel in um, Harlem that um, um, African Americans could not uh, leave there until 1940. It was actually at the moment of the, the decay of this typology when the hotel. Um, enter into a deep crisis and was sold uh, to an African-American and that changed the policy. So yes, they were deeply racialized and as many other things uh, of the time in New York. Um, and, uh, and I think that those we have to, I mean, at the same time, I'm, my interest is to unveil that reality because it has been neglected by the fact that lack of, apparently lack of any ideology which that's not true. Uh, but then obviously it was left as out, outside of the scope in those texts that were published in the 80s about uh, this uh, uh, femi material feminist. Um, but that doesn't mean that those typologies were actually 
deeply linked with what was going on and what was, uh, that was discussed. Uh, Charlotte Perry Gilman, as Dolores Hayden mentioned, she was claiming for apartment hotels and always complaining that developers uh, were not promoting that, but that was not actually true. It was uh, not true in all the cities. Uh, so I think that that's, that's uh, interesting to just be aware of, uh, but that doesn't deny it. Obviously, obviously they were redefining how reproductive labor was done and probably um, uh, they were um, um, deconstructing uh, the division of, of gender in that relation, but that doesn't mean necessarily the division in relations with uh, class, for instance. Uh, uh, so they were generating other divisions. Um, and I think that that's really important to, to be aware of. Um, in terms of um, actual practices um, and gender, um, I have researched about a collective kitchen in, in Peru that uh, thanks to collective cooking, actually women achieve uh, a political voice and uh, le domestic labor suddenly became something collective. And what I'm happy is that that practice influenced a lot of other practice in the last uh, decades. And there are really new ones. Most of them uh, have emerged after 2008 crisis. And what I'm uh, really happy to see is that, the, is that the new practices not necessarily are related with any specific gender. So domestic labor is not categorized as something of a that has to be performed by a specific gender, but rather it's not even discussed, which I think that it's super interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. Domestic labor for the first time is being discussed as something that it's actually an issue because it's poorly paid when it's paid. It, as Leslie was mentioning, it lacks of a lot of social right, rights. It's mostly not legalized in most of uh, the countries. So I think I'm totally aligned with uh, some of the th claims that uh, Leslie um, uh, were putting on the table and I'm gonna give you the word, Leslie. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll start with this, maybe this first question about who is the, the woman of the feminist city? Um, yeah, such a great question. I mean, I, I try to make the point in the book that this is not um, a vision of like replacing the kind of unspoken male, cis, heterosexual, able-bodied man at the center of planning with a woman who kind of looks just like him, but you know, has a skirt basically. <laughs> and that that is not actually gonna get us terribly far in terms of um, a level of radical changes. But what what I would say about this and, and you know, Jack mentioning like how to gender and architecture, how can they work together to actually break down um, this very problematic gender binary and assumptions about um, heterosexuality and, and the family. And, and to me, I think uh, that the spaces around us are actually part of continually producing and reproducing a, a notion of binary gender, of a static gender and of heterosexuality uh, as the norm. And so I think that there is potential in, if we change our spaces, <laughs> that we can start to shake that up. And, and honestly, one of the, the ways in which I just see this play out in like a very tangible way is, you know, people of my generation, people who are feminists say like, oh, you know, of course, my my household will be equal uh, in terms of domestic labor, and of course, my career will be prioritized just as much as my male partners. And then they move to the suburbs, and it all falls apart, right? And it's not just because of like their individual failures to live up to their ideals, but there is actually something about the space that is so <laughs> like powerful in kind of shaping these sorts of social relations that people with all of their best of intentions like find themselves kind of shoved back into these narrow kind of boxes around gender roles, family types, career, all that sort of thing. So to me, there, there is hope. And I love these ideas about, you know, unbuilding, dismantling uh, as kind of part of that project, because I think unbuilding certain things like the home is also unbuilding gender at the same time. Um, and, and I guess I'll segue into the second uh, set of questions around like ideas about the queer city and notions of safety and questions about gentrification. And yeah, these things are all like so tangled up together. Um, my, my sort of my main academic area of research is actually gentrification and, and gender. 
<sighs> yeah, I mean, where do I want to go with this? So many different directions. Like, to me, one of the the points that I, I wish I had even said more, like, in, in the book is that um, notions about women's safety and, and ideas about safety for women uh, cannot be used as tools to oppress and continue to over-police and be violent towards other communities. And I, I mean, I love that we've been able to have these conversations now, thanks to Black Lives Matter about defunding the police. And we'll sometimes hear these arguments like, well, what about violence against women, right? If we defund the police, what about violence against women? Isn't that a big problem? You're always talking about violence against women. Yes, but like, do, have the police actually ended violence against women or have helped with violence against women as a problem either in the home or in public spaces? I think largely no. So all of the things that we could be funding, whether it's childcare, affordable housing, social services, education, training, healthcare, those would go a lot further towards ending violence against women than anything that we could task police forces with doing. So I kind of continually want to like be um, pushing, pushing that point as I talk about the feminist city so that we don't end up in this kind of slippery like but what about safety what about violence uh, because to me the roots of that are are um going to be much better addressed with a whole other array of of social and spatial interventions beyond policing great okay um i'll, I'll just try you know ask one other question that will maybe bring these two projects together and then we'll go look in the chat and uh, in the questions and answers and take some questions from uh, the audience. But, you know, both of you sort of suggested that COVID is both uh, a kind of intensifier of the inequalities that already exist within social, political and environmental frameworks, but that also there are certain opportunities that are available in this moment of crisis, precisely because so many of the contradictions with which we usually seamlessly live have been exposed, right? So I wanted to ask about some of the opportunities that may or may not be available in this moment of crisis for thinking about what you both seem to be gesturing towards, which is a kind of utopian city built to a queer and feminist uh, uh, frame. And what about these collective, you know, and, and COVID is such a tricky framework precisely because the paradox of COVID is that all contradictions are laid bare, but collectivity is limited by uh, the mandate for social distancing. So, um, you know, take New York City, you, your area of research, Anna, where, you know, we see that potentially within a year, the entire restaurant industry is going to be decimated, um, predictions suggest, to the point where we will have to reimagine completely eating out. Is there any possibility, Anna, that one of the consequences of this is that people will turn away from the kind of consumer orientation to going out for food and turn instead towards sort of bubble-like collectivities within which food is made and shared and uh, distributed within very rigid safety precautions? And would such a project be able to draw on some of the research that you've done and some of the collective projects that pre-existed our deeply privatized and uh, consumer-oriented moment? And then in, in relationship to that, Leslie, I mean, one of your, your big ideas at the end was blow up the family, which you both offered us and then you kind of withdrew from. And I want you to dive deeper into that, maybe. Um, you know, Sophie Lewis's uh, work in her book, Full Surrogacy Now, has, has suggested the family has, has proven to be a very fragile and unsustainable unit in COVID. Um, and it seems to me that some of your research, Leslie, may in fact be deepening the arguments that uh, Marxist feminists like Sophie are making for why the family is one of the least attractive 
um, structures for a household that we could have chosen for our present moment and for the challenges that face us. So if you guys both want to, you know, take a, a stab at the utopian question, and then I'll start curating some of the uh, Q&A box uh, questions. Uh, the two cases that I was uh, referring before about uh, shared collective practice, contemporary shared collective practices, as I mentioned, both emerged after the crisis. Um, one in Mexico City due to the economical crisis that hit uh, largely uh, the middle class uh, there, and in order to um, uh, empower um, and generate uh, new labor, uh, it was actually a governmental decision. They started to promote uh, uh, to sell uh, food from home and suddenly they started to promote that um, uh, private kitchens could actually operate as community kitchens and, and to generate also labor, uh, understanding that that action of cooking could be paid. And it was extremely successful. Um, it's a bottom-up, top-down um, organization. So actually everyone has to do a little bit in order to decrease the cost of, of the food. And, and, and it's been extremely successful. And the other case that also provides a lot of uh, kind of hope is in Japan in the last... Um, 10 years, maybe less, eight years, um, due to the two big earthquakes, 1995 and 2011, uh, Japanese society realized about the lack of a social uh, fabric. And uh, there was a huge need to uh, reestablish new ways of new structures of family, new family structures that not necessarily needed to be uh, uh, blood related, but uh, community related. And a lot of uh, collective kitchens have emerged uh, just to, um, they operate um, not in a daily basis, one in, once in a while, as places of, of community, uh, to produce community social bonds, but also to help, uh, to be in help uh, for neighbors. And they're really growing. I'm, when, when I'm talking about, when my interest about these kitchens is that they operate in a urban level. So in uh, there are hundreds of them in Mexico and hundreds of them in Tokyo. So it's not just a community, you know, trying to change the world. It's a huge network that understand um, that caring is actually should be a public infrastructure as the libraries do uh, provide service for the public. And that's the huge change of mentality. Um, and uh, about the family, I think that it's a great, very, very good question. Leslie, let's see how you answer that. That's a really difficult one. <laughs> no, thank you for the question. And uh, I apologize for shying away from blowing up <laughs> the family. <laughs> Uh, but but uh, I absolutely agree. I mean, the family has proven to be just, I mean, even on the, even a, from a kind of, to me, a sort of an economic argument is a terribly inefficient way of organizing society. And I, I confess, I was peeking at one of the Q&A questions and someone mentioned climate change. And I think, you know, it's very energy inefficient, <laughs> the single family home and the ways in which we provide care and all of the immense amount of energy that both like human energy and nature's resources that it takes to you know keep this unit going and i think if nothing else changes if covid doesn't change it eventually climate change and energy crises will change the way that we do the family and the home so to me i think change is coming right it's just whether we want to like intentionally and proactively change it or whether we're forced to change it because we literally cannot survive uh, with the with the unit that we have but yeah I mean to me the, the family and you know it's confinement in this space that we call the home the family is something that is used as like a weapon against people who don't fit in to those norms and it's a boundary that um, includes and excludes people from all sorts of social resources, right? I mean, we, and if you think about what it means to blow up the family, blow up the home, it means blowing up the tax code, blowing up property law, blowing up citizenship rules, um, all sorts of things, right? We're so, that, that are all kind of layered together. And, you know, from a geographer, planner's perspective, we can think about space as being one of those layers as well, where all of those things come together. So one place of intervention, you know, if you're not changing the tax code might be, well, okay, what can we do about, uh, about the home? Um, so yeah, recognizing that, that this is a, a question that involves like 
basically any layer that we could think about in, in society, but recognizing the ways in which it has continually functioned as this boundary of inclusion and exclusion along lines of race, class, sexuality, gender, ability, age, citizenship, and so on, and realizing that, yeah, if we are moving towards some kind of utopian, more inclusive vision, then the family as we know it is not the unit that's, that's going to get us there. Okay, well, I definitely think we're agreed on that. Um, okay, let me let me refer to some of the questions. Um, in the, there are two um, e kind of short questions that I maybe will offer up for you guys to think about individually, and then I'll, I'll um, take us through a, f a few of the comments that are on the chat as well. Uh, one person is is asking you, Leslie whether there are any favorite examples that you have of communities that are doing a better job of distributing care networks, you know, do, in your book, do you have any particular examples of um, better systems of care? And then, uh, Anna, somebody wanted to ask, where were these private questions that could operate as community kitchens? I, I don't know what that refers to, but maybe it's um, in relationship to uh, the work in Lima. Um, there's an architect, Wanda Felt, uh, those were anonymous questions. Wanda Felt from Vancouver um, is remembering her own thesis research from the 90s on the importance of supports in neighborhood community to make women's lives as fulfilling and rich as possible. And she says that uh, she looked a lot at individual projects like housing for homeless, housing for youth, shelters for women, housing and support for people dealing with mental and physical uh, illness. And I think they're nested within that comment are some questions about, for example, homelessness and how homelessness might fit into either the work on kitchens on the one hand and feeding people who are outside of uh, housed reality altogether um, and um, homelessness in relationship to a feminist city. And, you know, just a question there about whether these collective projects that we're conjuring um, how they 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 might either eliminate the the problem of homelessness altogether by getting rid of the focus on private property, for example, or whether there's a kind of solution embedded within them. Um, in, and I, I like to say that homelessness is not the problem. The problem is homefulness, that some people have too many homes or too much investment in the home, which then makes the social uh, um, structure completely weighted towards property and is inevitably going to reduce in massive scale dispossession. So what about homeless uh, people within these uh, projects? Why don't we start there? So care communities, homelessness, um, the, the private kitchen to the community kitchen um, in relationship to youth shelters, homelessness and other social justice projects. Um, I'm going to jump in, Leslie. Um, I, I, let me, I think, well, it, um, about the private kitchen, it's really easy. It's the Mexico one uh, that basically uh, there's a law in Mexico City that you can, well, um, you need to apply for it, but you can um, operate a collective kitchen in your private kitchen if uh, you have a space uh, a bit large, which is quite easy in Mexico homes. Um, that's a fast answer. I think that the conversation about um, home and home ownership is extremely interesting because it's true that socially speaking, we have a bond with the idea of home. Um, and in history, uh, there we have, uh, you know, we know that we have had really perverse systems to the point of, you know, the Romans, that uh, if you lack of a home, and obviously you just homeowners could be male, but if you lack of a home, you were not even able to have a voice, a political voice in the police. So you were not able to even consider a citizen. And some, it's that, that that happened far away, right? A <laughs> long time ago, but something of that still exists. So the idea of being homeless is deeply um, uh, uh, badly perceived. And, and one of the things that I was fascinated by this typology of the 19th century with uh, share amenities was the fact that actually rooms could be, you know, um, be used depending on the time. So suddenly the limits of your home what so you could call home were not that clear and that sharp. Um, not only because you could expand the apartment and, and, and reduce it, but also because where you, your home started and end was not that 
it was much more diffuse. And I think that little steps, architecturally speaking, towards that direction would help to start understanding our home, not as a fixed entity, but something that is much more open and diffuse and which limits are blurred. And probably in the future, we would understand that actually our home is the city at large, which is much more related with the way actually we do inhabit our the city nowadays, the city. And we get rid of certain cliches that put a lot of um, physical bound um, mental boundaries on us. So I, I, I'm, you know, realizing many, many months too late that I should always come to these events with a list of positive examples because it's literally a question that I get every time and I'm always like, oh, um, <laughs> not, not that it's a bad question, but that I'm, I'm not like better prepared with like all of these like great examples to pull out of, out of my pockets. And I, I may have also given the impression that the book is more about like care work than it actually is. It's just that this has been the conversation that has uh, really taken over the moment given the time that the book um, came out in the US and the UK. But I guess I would, I would answer that by saying that there are, like I think you can look anywhere in any city and you can find examples of people who are doing things differently. You know, we can find co-housing projects that exist. We can find, um, you know, immigrant and refugee reception centers that have communal kitchens where people come together for everything from education and language classes to meals to craft making to childcare, all those sorts of things. So I think that there are these pockets that we can see different things being done. And I think we also, there's examples of like the kind of legal challenges to ideas about the family that are going on, you know, in, in a Canadian example is, um, you know, two, two women who were friends and one uh, had, was a single mother and, and her child had some pretty severe disabilities and the two women were able to um, both like ad adopt um, the child essentially, uh, even though they were not in a conjugal relationship, they were just friends. And that was actually kind of a precedent setting law. There's another case right now about, um, you know, just a, a couple, one of whom is a, a gay man who had sex with his best friend, who was a woman and they had a baby. And the question is like, are they a family, right? Even though they're not going to continue in a conjugal relationship and the law said, well, actually they could be considered in that way. So I think we're seeing these moments where people, uh, because our lives, most people's lives don't conform so neatly to this kind of long-term heterosexual marriage, family, children, that, that we're starting to see ways in which both the law and perhaps our cities and spaces are gonna try to take some of that into account. Okay, great. And I, I just wanted to mention um, one other, book that people might be interested in in relationship to care networks, which is Mullen Bailey's book on Black and Latino uh, gay and trans people involved in the ball scenes in Detroit and New York City and uh, uh, Atlanta, I think. Um, and he has a chapter in that book, which is called Butch Queen Up in Pumps. Um, and the chapter is about the HIV AIDS crisis and the way in which these uh, households in the drag ball scene um, were, um, you know, absolutely stepped up and took responsibility for each other's care in ways that were not at all supported by the state or by um, the, you know, medical system, um, but offered intense forms of kinship and caregiving. Um, mostly in the context of kind of hospice-like situations. Uh, and it's, a, it's just a really, it's a very moving um, piece about caregiving that is um, queer, feminist, urban-oriented, and part of these kind of subterranean systems that are all, uh, all around the city, but never usually factored into the uh, mainstream narratives that emerge. Okay, well, final question, the one that maybe you mentioned, Leslie, earlier, and maybe you'd like to start with this, is the question of climate activism, which comes from uh, Valerio Franzone on the Q&A, and she asks, how can we match a gender diverse approach uh, or politics with climate activism? How does climate activis activism play into the projects that each one of you are committed to? 
Um, yeah, I see them as completely interlinked in that I don't think we can think about a kind of climate sustainable, climate resilient future without radically rethinking social relations around gender, race, class, age, ability, sexuality, and so on. Uh, because Clearly the system as we have set it up is not sustainable. And in fact, those inequalities that are so built into our capitalist, patriarchal, heteronormative, white supremacist system are the things that are, to me anyways, are causing <laughs> the destruction of the environment that is leading to climate change. So I don't think there's any way that we can look to the future without taking that into account. I'm heartened by, you know, when I see the, the young people that I, work with as a university professor going out on climate marches and the speeches that they make are like they're very intersectional like they get that part of this problem is settler colonialism they get that patriarchy is part of the problem like they are not separating these issues out so I do have a lot of hope that for the next generation of climate activists these questions are these interlinkages are obvious they're not something that they have to force themselves to think about in tandem with one another but they are just like they know they know it at a, at a gut level uh Anna do you want to answer that I think that's a perfect answer yeah <laughs> yeah perfect <laughs> All right. Well, it's uh, just about for, for the person who didn't catch it. The book that I referred to is Marlon Bailey, Butch Queen Up in Pumps. Uh, there was a question about that in the box. Um, I just wanted to thank our panelists and remind you to go out and buy Leslie Stern, uh, Leslie Kern's uh, uh, wonderful book, The Feminist City. Um, and Anna, we're eagerly awaiting The Kitchenless City. Is it out already? No, it's but very it soon. Be really soon. Very soon. Uh, the research sounds incredible. Um, so we're we're really looking forward to that. And of course, we want to thank GSAP, uh, Lila, everybody who um, Amale who has helped to put this event together. Um, it's been fantastic, uh, and I think we can all go out and put these ideas into practice and start building that collective city. So thank you both. Thank you so much. Thank you. Really appreciate thank it. Thank you. Thanks very much.